people can value nothing more highly than the dignity and liberty of its existence, that it must defend these to the last drop of its blood, so there is no higher duty to fulfil, no higher law to obey, that the shameful blood of cowardly submission can never be erased, that this drop of poisoning in the blood of a nation is passed on to posterity, crippling and eroding the strength of future generations. The presence of a commander should be constantly felt and evoke a feeling of courage within his men. If the wars of civilized people are less cruel and destructive than those of savages. The difference arises from the social condition, both of states in themselves and in their relations to each other. Out of this social condition and its relations, war arises, and by it war is subjected to conditions, is controlled and modified. But these things do not belong to war itself, they are only given conditions. And to introduce into the philosophy of war itself a principle of moderation would be an absurdity. A distinguished commander without boldness is unthinkable. No man who is not bold can play such a role, and therefore we consider this quality the first prerequisite of the great military leader. How much of this quality remains by the time he reaches senior rank, after training and experience have affected and modified it, is another question. The greater the extent to which it is retained, the greater the range of his genius. Everything in war is very simple, but the simplest thing is difficult. There are very few men, and they are the exceptions, who are able to think and feel beyond the present moment. If we then ask, what sort of mind is likeliest to display the qualities of military genius? Experience and observation will both tell us that it is the inquiring rather than the creative mind, the comprehensive rather than the specialized approach, the calm rather than the excitable head to which, in war, we would choose to entrust. No one starts a war, or rather, no one in his sense ought to, without being first clear in his mind what he intends to achieve by that war and how he intends to conduct it. Boldness, governed by superior intellect, is the mark of a hero. Our knowledge of circumstances has increased, but our uncertainty, instead of having diminished, has only increased. The reason of this is that we do not gain all our experience at once, but by degrees. So, our determinations continue to be assailed incessantly by fresh experience, and the mind, if we may use the expression, must always be under arms. The probability of direct confrontation increases with the aggressiveness of the enemy. So, rather than try to outbid the enemy with complicated schemes, one should, on the contrary, try to outbid him in simplicity.
Of all the passions that inspire a man in a battle, none, we have to admit, is so powerful and so constant as the longing for honour and renown. If the mind is to emerge unscathed from this relentless struggle with the unforeseen, two qualities are indispensable. First, an intellect that, even in the darkest hour, retains some glimmerings of the inner light which leads to truth. And second, the courage to follow this faint light wherever it may lead. Although our intellect always longs for clarity and certainty, our nature often finds uncertainty fascinating. Kind-hearted people might of course think there was some ingenious way to disarm or defeat an enemy without too much bloodshed, and might imagine this is the true goal of the art of war. Pleasant as it sounds, it is a fallacy that must be exposed. War is such a dangerous business that the mistakes which come from kindness are the very worst. The talent of the strategist is to identify the decisive point and to concentrate everything on it, removing forces from secondary fronts and ignoring lesser objectives. If we have made appropriate preparations, taking into account all possible misfortunes, so that we shall not be lost immediately if they occur, we must boldly advance into the shadows of uncertainty. We repeat again, strength of character does not consist solely in having powerful feelings, but in maintaining one's balance in spite of them. Even with the violence of emotion, judgment and principle must still function like a ship's compass, which records the slightest variations, however rough the sea. If the leader is filled with high ambition, and if he pursues his aims with audacity and strength of will, he will reach them in spite of all obstacles. All war presupposes human weakness and seeks to exploit it. Peace is maintained by the equilibrium of forces and will continue just as long as this equilibrium exists and no longer. Essentially, combat is an expression of hostile feelings, but in the large-scale combat that we call war, hostile feelings often have become merely hostile intentions. At any rate, there are usually no hostile feelings between individuals, yet such emotions can never be completely absent from war. Modern wars are seldom fought without hatred between nations. This serves as a more or less substitute for the hatred between individuals. Even when there is no natural hatred and no animosity to start with, the fighting itself will stir up hostile feelings. Violence committed on superior orders will stir up the desire for revenge and retaliation against the perpetrator, rather than against the powers that ordered the action. It is only human, or animal if you like, but it is a fact. <laughs>